in Beirut with Jamana Karadsha. Jamana, the airstrikes continuing today. I wonder if you could describe uh, the, the situation in Beirut, including uh, civilian casualties. Well, you know, Jim, we are right on the edge of the southern suburbs of Beirut that has been the focus of these intense Israeli airstrikes. Uh, especially in the past 48 hours almost, uh, these airstrikes continuing. And as a result of that, we have seen this mass exodus of, uh, of civilians, of the people of the area known as Dahye of uh, Beirut. And I think you can see behind me right now, we're starting... We're still seeing people who are either now getting the chance to leave with the little they can carry or who have tried to go back and pick up some belongings and get out of there. Um, we're right outside a school that has been turned into a shelter. This is one of several of those shelters around uh, Beirut. But the authorities are struggling to keep up with the number of people who have been displaced. In a matter of days, Jim, according to authorities, about a million people have been displaced across Lebanon, mostly in the southern part of the country, the southern suburbs of Beirut, as well as the eastern part of the country. And if you look at Beirut's southern suburbs, um, this is one of the most densely populated areas or was of Beirut. It had a Hezbollah presence, as we saw. This is where the Israelis uh, killed the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, and other top commanders of the group. But it is also home to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who have now been forced out of their homes. Uh, as I mentioned, some are in these schools, but then you also have so many others who don't know where they are going to go for for days now they have been on the street i mean just a short time ago we were in central beirut in the heart of the capital and we found people still camped outside on pavements in parks families with little children we spoke to lebanese families syrian refugees who have been in this country for 10 years who fled the civil war in their country and now they're here displaced again with nowhere to go we met uh, migrant workers from bangladesh from ethiopia an absolutely desperate situation and we're talking about people on the streets with no toilets, no facilities. I mean, we heard from some people saying they've had to go down to the sea to wash because they have nowhere else to go. And I met an elderly woman from Syria, and she said that she fled the airstrikes. She didn't even have shoes on. All she grabbed was a little plastic bag with her medications and a little pack of tissues because that's what she does to survive. She sells those tissues, Jim, and she lives off of that. And, and now she broke down crying, saying she just doesn't know what is going to happen to them now. She doesn't have a home in Syria. It was destroyed in the Civil War, and she has no money, no place to go to here. And it's story after story like this, an absolutely desperate uh, situation here, Jim. Of course, it's a sadly familiar story. So often civilians caught in the middle of this conflict paying a high price. Jomena Karadsha in Beirut, thanks so much. I do want to go now to Jeremy Diamond in Haifa in northern Israel. Uh, Jeremy, I, I understand the U.S. perspective here is that they are watching, at least for the possibility of an Israeli ground incursion into southern Lebanon. Israeli officials to date have said that's just one option on the table for them. What is the latest, and has Israel put in the preparations to allow for a force to cross the border? Well, the preparations are certainly underway. Whether they have sufficient troops or not, uh, depending on the scale of this ground incursion, uh, is another question altogether. And beyond that, of course, what is clear, Jim, is that the Israeli government has yet to actually make a final decision about whether or not a ground incursion is indeed the next step. Uh, U.S. officials telling us that they are indeed seeing the preparations being made for a limited ground incursion, and they're seeing that based off of the mobilization of troops along Israel's northern border, as well as clearing certain areas that could be used to send troops into Lebanon. My team and I actually filmed video 
of Israeli tanks uh, near the border with Lebanon on Friday. We saw them amassed in a field off the side of a highway. We were told that they had just arrived there uh, in the hours uh, before we, we passed by. And so clearly the Israeli military has activated two additional uh, reserve uh, brigades, uh, sent them to the north in recent weeks. They had also sent the 98th Division, which was fighting in Gaza, redirected it to the northern border. So it's clear that the preparations are being made. And the messaging is quite clear from Israeli generals as well, who said as, as recently as uh, or as late as last Wednesday uh, that they were indeed preparing for that uh, eventuality. In the meantime, though, what the Israeli military is doing right now is that they are continuing to carry out dozens of strikes in uh, Lebanon. Most of those strikes happening in southern Lebanon as well as the Baalbek region, but we've also seen, of course, an increased pace of attacks in the southern suburbs of Beirut as well. And that's because Israeli officials tell me that they believe Hezbollah right now is in disarray, that their operational capabilities have been extremely debilitated by the rounds of Israeli airstrikes over the course of the last week, and of course the killing of many of its senior leaders, including of course on Friday, its leader Hassan Nasrallah. And so they believe that this is the moment to uh, do as much damage to Hezbollah as possible, but they are also quite clear-eyed about the fact that Hezbollah can reconstitute and likely will at some point. And so that's also why they are watching to see what Iran does, uh, what, uh, what remains of Hezbollah does, and what the decision making is eventually about how much uh, of a wide scale retaliation will be planned for Israel uh, and, and when that might come. Jim. Yeah, it's a legitimate question. How could Hezbollah even communicate plans for a retaliatory strike given? Uh, the decapitation strikes, we've seen a series of them, but also those pager attacks, uh, which, which took out, it seems, uh, what was their backup uh, communication network. Uh, Jeremy Diamond in Haifa, thanks so much. Uh, joining me now, Jasmine Al-Gamala, former Pentagon Middle East advisor. Uh, also joining us, retired Air Force Colonel and CNN military analyst Cedric Layton. Uh, if I could begin with you, Jasmine, and it's good to have you both on this morning. You know, this phrase we hear, which is which is another familiar one, limited ground incursion, at the end of the day, that would be sending Israeli forces across the border into Le Lebanon, a step we have not seen in numbers for 18 years going back to the 2006 uh, Israel-Lebanon war, when, uh, one, the outcome of that incursion, invasion, whatever you want to call it, was uncertain, but the cost for Israeli forces was high. Is there, is it possible to have a limited incursion or once you're in is it is it something quite big especially concerning an expansion of this conflict good to see you again jim thanks for having me um i, I think it's exactly as you said i mean it's very difficult to control these things once they actually happen this happened in 2006, where Israel thought it was going to be a really quick war. It ended up lasting for over a month and doing much more damage to them than they expected. Yeah. Now, they've obviously you know, trained better. They've learned a lot of things from that um, 2006 war with Hezbollah that you imagine they would be applying today. But again, um, the, you know, the Middle East, the best of intentions or the best laid plans, I should say, not the best of intentions, never seem to go quite as, as planned because you don't actually know what the reaction will be. We don't know the status of Hezbollah's fighting force right now, how organized they are. Obviously, as we spoke about yesterday, their communications um, with, it, with each other has been severely degraded. So you don't know how they would be communicating in such a, a, an invasion or in such a conflict on the ground with Israeli forces. There are a lot of unknowns that wouldn't actually be revealed until Israel goes in. And by that time, you have to you have to sort of understand that it would be too late to dramatically shift their plans. They would just be in it. Yeah. Colonel Cedric Layton, we, we've seen an enormous number of Israeli airstrikes, not not just on Hezbollah leaders, but also Hezbollah weapon storage facilities, uh, both in Beirut, but also across southern Lebanon, dozens of them uh, going after positions and the weapons themselves. What could ground forces do that those airstrikes have not yet done? What, what would be, uh, and I know you're not in the room there, as, in the Situation Room as they planned this uh, on the Israeli side, but, but what would be the likely additional mission of ground forces on top of the airstrikes? 
But one of the big uh, aspects of a ground incursion, Jim, would be the idea of actually taking territory and holding it. Uh, so what could happen in a case like this is the air campaign has softened up the targets. They've destroyed some things. Uh, the ground forces would then move in. They would then uh, see how badly uh, the uh, Hezbollah weapons systems had been destroyed and destroy them even further if they, if they could, if they're right there with them, uh, or they would make sure that they could not be used uh, in, a, you know, in, in an attempt to, to attack uh, the northern part of Israel. Uh, so ground forces become really important to hold territory as well as to ensure that any damage caused by an air campaign is basically a, a permanent form of damage.